Hi, my name is Jad Salem, and today I'll be talking about mitigating bias in online resume filtering. And this is joint work with Swati Gupta. Resume filtering is the process of selecting a subset of applicants to proceed to the next round of hiring. You can think of resume filtering as selecting which applicants to grant interviews to. Many companies have a high, a high volume of applications, so this process is often automated. And the way it's automated is typically to have a machine learning model numerically score applications, and then those scores can be used to determine who proceeds to the next round. There are some practical complications with this problem. First of all, any machine learning model will be inaccurate in some way and these inaccuracies can be problematic. Another complication is the online nature of hiring. You may have to make hiring decisions quickly, and so you might have to make these decisions without seeing the complete applicant pool. A another issue is uh, that since this problem affects people's lives, there are some legal and ethical and maybe moral constraints that you might want to impose on your algorithms. So broadly speaking, some of our propo proposed solutions are to account for these inaccuracies in a way that I'll discuss later, and to avoid reducing applicants to a single number. Now, evaluations of applicants, whether they're derived from a machine learning model or otherwise, can be biased. And when I say biased, I mean they can be inaccurate in a way that depends on group membership, demographic group membership in some way. For example, human evaluators can be influenced by implicit bias. For instance, there was this study where a bunch of applications were sent to science faculty and the faculty were, were told to rate the applications on hireability. Now, all of these applications were the same, except some of the applications had the name John and some had the name Jennifer and they found that John received a higher hireability rating than Jennifer. And so this is an example of implicit bias on the evaluator's part. Another way that evaluations can be biased is if the evaluation metric itself is inadequate. For example, there was this study that showed that high status individuals tended to perform better than low status individuals. So in this study, um, test takers were randomly assigned high and low status, and the high status individuals had a higher perceived reward or expected reward for good performance on the test. And they showed that those who had those higher expectations and the higher status tended to perform better than those with low status. Another way that evaluation metrics can be biased is through a stereotype threat. So if a test is announced to exhibit differences across groups. So for example, if, if the test is announced to, if it's announced that one group of people perform better on the test than others, then members of the stereotyped group will tend to perform worse on that test. Um, another way that bias can enter the system is through the machine learning itself. Um, machine learning typically uses historic data as training data and builds models based on the historic data. Now, the historic data is just a reflection of our society. If there's some societal inequality that is likely to be um, present in the training data somehow, and therefore it's likely to be perpetuated by the machine learning algorithm. There's been uh, a lot of recent work in modeling bias. For example, Kleinberg and Raghavan proposed a group model of bias a couple years ago, where elements are partitioned into disjoint demographic groups, and each group has a specific bias. Uh, Celis et al. generalized this to account for intersectional groups recently. And another interesting recent model of bias is by Emilianov et al. Um, and they, they proposed a model where errors have differing variances depending on the demographic group. So we'll be coming back to these topics throughout the, the talk. 
So in this talk, we'll, we'll begin by talking a little bit about bias and the group model of bias. Then we'll discuss a theoretical framework for online selection, in other words, online resume filtering. And then we'll discuss our contributions, which include um, algorithms for the group model of bias, proposing a new model of bias, which generalizes group bias, and giving an algorithm for, for this new model of bias, which we call POSET bias. So first, let's start by talking about the group model of bias, where elements are partitioned into G disjoint demographic groups. Each group has some unknown bias factor, and the scores observed by the algorithm will just be the, the true score of the applicant divided by their group's bias factor. This model of bias was studied by Kleinberg and Raghavan in offline selection, where they can see the entire applicant pool to begin with. And they showed that some sort of affirmative action called the Rooney rule is effective in improving the, the expected total score of selected applicants under some parameter choices. And our goal will be to come up with some sort of similar result in the online selection case, where you don't have access to all of the applicants at once. So now um, I'll introduce the theoretical framework that we use for online selection. We'll use the secretary problem, which is a classical problem in theoretical computer science, where n elements are presented to an algorithm one by one in random order. Each element reveals its weight to the algorithm when it arrives, and then the algorithm must make an immediate and irrevocable decision on whether or not to select that element. There are typically some constraints that are placed on the sets of elements that can be selected, but in our case, this will always be a cardinality constraint. So suppose we wanted to pick one element from the following five. They'll arrive one by one, revealing their weights. At some point, we have to stop and say, okay, I select this element. And we have to do that with only partial knowledge of the applicant pool. So we don't know if the next two elements will be higher weight or lower weight. So that's the, the secretary problem. A secretary algorithm is typically, we, we measure its performance using its competitive ratio. Um, an algorithm is said to be alpha competitive if its expected performance ratio is at least one over alpha. And one classical result is that the one secretary out problem where we can only select one element has an e-competitive algorithm. Now, what happens if we want to select k elements instead of one? Well, here's a, a classical algorithm by Babayaf, Mordecai, Kleinberg, and Kempf, where we first begin by sampling a bunch of elements, and then um, we select elements if they, they beat some dynamic increasing threshold, uh, plus some other technical condition. And this, this algorithm is also e-competitive, which generalizes the result that we just talked about for the one secretary problem. So our goal will be to design competitive algorithms when we don't have access to the true weight, but only a biased weight. So, so instead of the true scores being revealed to the algorithm, we'll assume biased scores are revealed. So let's introduce the, the biased case secretary problem. So in this problem, again, elements will arrive to the algorithm one by one in random order, and they'll reveal biased scores instead of their true scores. Again, our select reject decisions are immediate and irrevocable, and only K elements or applicants can be selected. So if we use the same algorithm that, that we just discussed for the case secretary problem, the competitive ratio is at least the maximum bias factor. So it's no longer constant like it was for the unbiased setting. We've also shown that any algorithm for this problem is at least omega G competitive. That means the best we could possibly do is to develop an ordered G competitive algorithm where G is the number of groups. So here's a little example. Suppose we have five different groups where in any group, if a vertex is higher than another vertex, then that applicant is better. So in this case, 
if we're assuming the group model of bias, what's the best way to choose five applicants? Well, if we're trying to maximize, if we're, if we're trying to optimize our worst case performance ratio, then we would pick the best element in each group. And this would give us a performance ratio of five. So let's talk a little bit about what it might be, what it might mean to be fair in this context. Um, ideally, we would want two applicants who are who have similar ability to have a similar probability of selection. But in our partial information setting, we can't really measure what it means for two applicants to be similarly able. So instead, we propose ranked demographic parity, which says that any two elements of that are equally ranked and equally sized groups should have the same probability of selection. So in this example, the two red applicants would have to have the same probability of selection. And similarly, the two green ones would also have to have the same probability of selection. So there are a bunch of different models that we can consider for this problem. We could allow the group assignment to be random or adversarial, and we can allow the score assignment to also be random or adversarial. Um, we'll mostly just be focusing on the fully adversarial setting in this, in this talk. But just so you know, here are different competitive ratios that we've, we've achieved for the different settings. Notice that whenever the score assignment is adversarial, our competitive ratio has a factor of G, and that's, that's optimal. However, when we allow for random score assignments, we, do, um, we are able to achieve a constant competitive ratio simply by hedging our bets. So as a, a, a food for thought, what happens if we simply impose demographic quotas? Well, if we do this, then we get a, an ordered G competitive algorithm. So, so we hit our goal of achieving a competitive algorithm, but the issue is that we're using quotas and this may or, not, may or may not be legal depending on your setting. So we will be trying to avoid doing something like this. So how can we develop an algorithm that does not use quotas? Um, so, so first let, let's talk about the K equals one case. So, so suppose we just want to select one applicant. Then what we can do is we can sample a bunch of elements and then pick the next element that is a record in a group. So it's better than all the other applicants we've seen in it. So if we do this, how can we analyze our competitive ratio? Well, suppose this, this green vertex is the, the best applicant overall. What's the probability that we actually select the green vertex? Well, we can bound this by considering the event that all of these red vertices are sampled and the green one is not. Because if that happens, then we're, we're forced to choose the green element. So this, in the end, gives us an ordered G competitive algorithm. So, so this solves our problem when we only want to pick one applicant. Now, how can we generalize this for other values of K? Well, essentially what we do is we randomly split all of the applicant, applicants into K sets and run the same algorithm on each of those random sets. And this gives us an ordered G competitive algorithm again. So how do we, how do we prove this? Well, suppose E1 through EK are the, the random sets we've generated. Then what's the probability that the J best applicant is the best applicant in its random group? Well, we can bound this by one over E, and that gives us our competitive ratio. So um, now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about other models of bias. So th there are some natural complaints that people might have with the group model of bias. For example, it completely ignores any sort of variation within groups. It assumes that all of the applicants in the same group experience the same amount of bias, which is simply not going to be true in practice. Another issue is that it completely ignores any possible comparisons between groups. Um, and that's also something that's not quite realistic. 
typically we will be able to make some comparisons between applicants in different groups. So these are two things we'd like to address. So let's take a little example. Suppose we have two groups, G1 and G2, and we have two, L, two applicants in each group. Um, if, so suppose we have this instance of group bias, but suppose that we also know that the bias factor of group one is less than the bias factor of group two. That means group two experiences more bias. Then we can additionally make this extra comparison that E1 is worse than E4. Now, all of a sudden, we no longer have an instance of group bias. We have something a little bit more general. So before we completely generalize this, let me give some more examples. Suppose that for each applicant E, instead of, instead of the algorithm receiving a weight, a, a score, or even a biased score, suppose it receives an interval containing the true score. So this could, these intervals could come from score ranges from multiple evaluators. They could come from confidence intervals based on some sort of group-specific error coming from a machine learning model. They could come from ranges of bias factors for each group. And they can more generally just come from testing and accuracies. So uh, we can take another example. Suppose we have two groups and we have these following intervals that I've drawn, um, we can make some, com some comparisons between the applicants. Uh, for example, the interval of E2 is completely to the left of the interval of E1, which means that E2 is definitely a, a worse applicant than E1. However, some applicants are incomparable. For example, E3 and E2 have overlapping intervals, so we don't really know which applicant is better. So we get the following comparisons that I've drawn on the right. So, so this indicates that E4 is worse than E2 is worse than E1, but there are some incomparabilities, like we can't compare E2 and E3 or E4 and E3. As one more example, suppose we have a machine learning model that will score applicants. Um, but suppose that applicants come from two groups, G1 and G2, and the second group, G2, is highly underrepresented in the training data. This means that group G2 is likely to experience larger error rates than group G1. So suppose we have the following, uh, th the following biased scores in the table. Um, we can develop confidence intervals like I've drawn below. So notice that A3 and A4, who are the applicants of group two, have wider intervals than A1 and A2. This is to take into account the fact that there could be a, a larger variance in errors for group G2. So continuing this example, suppose we wanted to pick two applicants. If we just use the raw scores, the biased scores, then applicants A1 and A2 would be selected. And note that A1 and A2 are both members of group G1. Now, if we use the, the interval model, then who are the top two applicants? It's no longer so clear. It's possible that A1 and A2 are still the, the best applicants if A1 and A2 both have scores that are towards the right of their intervals. But it's also possible that A2 and A4 are the top two applicants. So, Adopting these confidence intervals instead of the raw scores gives the opportunity for A4 to be considered for selection. More generally, um, all of these, these examples that I just discussed can be characterized as an example of POSET bias, where um, two applicants can either be comparable or incomparable. So in POSET bias, there's some partial ordering on the applicants, and this partial ordering respects the, the total ordering of true abilities. So at any point, um, if an algorithm has seen some set of applicants, the algorithm can make comparisons between those applicants according to the partial order. So note that the algorithm does not have access to the, the complete partial order to begin with, it can only compare applicants who have arrived already. 
So no, notice that post-up bias is just a generalization of group bias. So for example, if we take this, this example that we discussed earlier, then this is just a partial order with five disjoint chains. Now, in a poset, the width of a poset is just the maximum number of mutually incomparable elements. So in this case, the width of this poset is just the number of groups. In our interval example that, that we also discussed, um, these, these, kinds of, these kinds of posets are called interval orders, and the width of an interval order is just the maximum number of mutually overlapping intervals. So these are two important examples of post-up bias. So just to be formal, let me introduce the, the post-set secretary problem, which we call PS, which we abbreviate as PSP. So n elements or applicants um, will arrive to the algorithm one by one in random order. Um, and as elements arrive, they reveal, <clears throat> as elements arrive, they reveal rankings with previously arrived elements according to the partial order. And again, select reject decisions have to be made immediately and they're irrevocable. So again, we can only select up to K elements, K applicants, and we're trying to maximize the, the total true score of applicants that we select. So just, just so we're all on the same page, um, here's an example of an instance of the post-set secretary problem. We, anything that's in black is something that the algorithm can see, and anything that's in gray is something that, that the algorithm cannot see. So as elements arrive, they reveal any comparisons that can be made with previously arrived elements. In the end, we can see the entire structure of the partially ordered set. So what does it mean to be fair in this context? Well, again, we would like we would like applicants with similar ability to have a similar probability of selection. And again, as with the, the group model, we don't have a good way to measure similarity and ability. So we have to rely on, on the partial ordered set. So in this case, we'll say that any two applicants that can be swapped by, by an order isomorphism should have the same probability of selection. So in this example, E2 and E4 should have the same probability of selection. And similarly, E5 and E6 should have the same probability of selection. This is the closest we can get to the, the ideal that equally abled applicants have the same probability of selection. So what can so what sorts of algorithms can we design for, for this post-set secretary problem? Well, the algorithm we propose will partition applicants into k random sets, just like we did in the group case. And instead of now we'd like we, we'd like that in each of these random sets we choose the, the best applicant but we don't really know which applicant is best because of the partial information, because we're using a partially ordered set instead of a totally ordered set. So what we'll do in the algorithm is we'll, we'll try to maximize the probability that we pick a maximal element in each of these random sets. Now, this ends up giving us an order with competitive algorithm where the width, again, is the, the maximum number of mutually incomparable elements. So let me say, I, also, this is optimal. It's order optimal. So, so let me say a few words about the analysis before I close. Suppose this is our partially ordered set. Now, in, in this partially ordered set, we know for sure that the green element is the best one. So how can we bound the probability that we select the green element? Well, Suppose we partition our post-set into uh, high-information subsets. And what I mean by a high-information subset is a subset where we can compare any two applicants. So in this decomposition that I've outlined here, within each bubble, we can compare all of the applicants. So suppose we find this decomposition. And uh, so, so once we find this decomposition, if we require that 
all of these red elements are sampled and the green one, and the green element is not, then the green element is definitely going to be selected by the algorithm. And the key thing to notice is that by Dilworth's theorem, the, the minimum number of bubbles that are required is just the width of the post set. And so this gives us our order width competitive ratio, which again is optimal. So I'll, I'll stop here and I welcome questions. <laughs>